So nothing surprises me. So. Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started now. I guess I'm, yeah, I'm not muted. Um, and it uh, looks like Eric, you're the only one that's Zooming, but uh, we'll just go with this. So we're going to look at joints and articulations today. And this is going over, you know, as less than, less than exciting as it may sound, we've, got, we, we've had some pretty good discussions uh, the past two days talking about things that go wrong with our joints. <laughs> and lots of people have offered up examples, personal examples of things that go wrong. Um, I had uh, we had students with water on their knee that their knees sounded like aluminum foil frankly, when they moved their knee, their knee joints. And people have talked about other things that have happened to them. So we're going to, you know, if you feel the urge to share any of your injuries, uh, let me know. I'll tell you some of mine. So anyway, uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get into this. Thank you. You all get, okay, good. So let's, joints and articulations. Anytime we have bones that um, come together, 
we're, we have movement. That's an articulation. When two bones come together, now the movement may, may be minimal to non-existent, or it can be something that's freely movable, but this is when we have a uh, wrong picture. You'll see, see that in a, in a few minutes anyway, so there we go. Movements and articulations, structure and movement. Joints are classified by the type of movement they have and what their structure is. Fortunately, there's only three of each. There's only three types of motion and there's only three types of structures. We classify our, our, our joints this way. Anytime we have a bone on bone interaction, it's an articulation. The articulation may be no movement. It can be free movement. Structure depends on how the joint is made. So, Articulations. Anytime where two bones come together, they can be a no movement where it's an immovable joint. It can be a slightly movable joint. It can be freely movable. Yes. This is uh, joints and articulations uh, should be the last PowerPoint set you have for uh, uh, unit two on, on the bones. So you know, you know, you know, you couldn't get away with just learning the bones without learning some of the things that can go wrong with the bones too. As far as uh, you know, our joints give us all sorts of trouble, particularly as we age and we injure them too. So um, now we can have an immovable joint. We can have a slightly movable joint. We can have a freely movable joint. Most of our um, most of our uh, joints are freely movable. If we classify them with the, the, uh, the, the technical term, we say that a uh, immovable joint is a synarthrotic joint, doesn't move. You see that the, the, the part of the word arthrotic is in there, you know, that we derive arthritis from that. It has to do with bone, you know, bone and bone motion. So synarthrotic, uh, joints where we have very little movement. The sutures in our skull are going to be a immovable synarthrotic uh, joint. The mental symphysis right here, it's left over from where uh, our, our mandible came together. The teeth in our sockets and the first costosternal joint. So let's take a look here at our cadaver here, and I have taken off all the skin and left nothing but the bone behind. Here we can see in the very top, uh, we, you're, what you're looking at there is the top of the skull, and what we see are the suture lines. Yeah. Uh, we've seen this in our skull models, but this is, the, you know, this is the coronal suture, this is the sagittal suture, this is a joint. It's, immo it's immovable. It doesn't move. It doesn't give. It has no flexibility. And this is a, uh, an, immove, an Im, immovable joint. We don't want it to give. We, you know, the days of it being flexible are long gone. You know, when we still had our anterior fontanelle, yeah, we had, we had some flexibility, but we don't want it anymore. Now in our, um, if we take a look at the mandible, let's bring it down a little bit here. We can see, let's see it shrink it down just a little bit and then I can tilt her back. There we go, a little more. There we go. The mental symphysis is another, another joint that doesn't really exist anymore. It's right here at the bottom of the, um, that, just, that doesn't help, let me do it this way. There we go. Mental symphysis you know what's disappointing is on the on the anatomos the head's about this wide and up there it's only like this big. But anyway, 
This is the mental synthesis right here, where the two parts of the mandible grew together when we were in utero laying down our bone. That doesn't move either. In fact, we don't even notice it's there. The teeth in our sockets. If you look at our teeth here on the skull, you can see that the, the teeth are held in place by uh, a ligament called the periodontal ligament. And the teeth are embedded in the bone of the mandible and the maxilla. If you've ever had a tooth extracted, you may have heard the comment from the, the orthodontist saying, now you're not gonna feel any pain, liar, uh, but you will feel a lot of pressure because they have to pop it out of the socket. And then the last immovable joint we would look at is right here at what we call the costosternal joint, the very first joint. Let's bring it down, let's bring it up a little bit here. Okay, right where I am touching right here, there's the sternum and there is the first rib at the top here. We've highlighted it in white. This right where this mark is, where my fingers, that is the first costosternal joint and the other one's on this side over here. Those joints don't move. The flexibility that we get with our ribs and our sternum uh, takes place at the hyaline cartilage. It's outlined here in white. Um, it, 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 uh, it works in the rest of the sternum proper, but not where it attaches to the manubrium. We have an, in, an immovable joint right there. So there are places where we have joints that don't move. Now, the slightly movable joints, we've seen those before. Those are the intervertebral discs. The remaining joints of the sternum and, and the ribs, you know, everything else, you know, the hyaline cartilage, that's our ribs that uh, move up when our, um, when, our muscles when our muscles contract. These muscles that are between the ribs, Let's bring that in here. Put some muscles back in. There they are. These are the, the intercostal muscles here and here and here and here. When those muscles contract, the ribs rise up. And when the ribs rise, the chest wall rises up. And since our lungs are glued to the inside of the chest wall, the lungs expand. And then when these relax, then the ribs go down and the air in our lungs is, is pushed out. That's also the same muscle we like. If we like to eat ribs, that's what we're eating, those intercostal muscles. Now, if you wanna see where the lungs are, that we glue under there in place directly underneath. Yeah, okay, here, there's the left lung and over here is the right lung directly underneath uh, the ribs. So the lungs are glued to the inside of the wall and the ribs, uh, when the ribs elevate, when those intercostal muscles contract, the lungs go with it. It's a whole process of breathing. So let's go on now. The diarthrotic joints, the freely movables, the shoulder, the knee, the hip, the inner phalangeals, the tarsals, the car tarpals. We'll get to those here in a second. So these immovable joints, the sutures of the skull and the gomphosis, that's what we call the socket, the gomphosis of the teeth. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into AP2. Um, we'll talk when we get into the digestive system of AP2. Uh, we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about teeth and teeth disorders, and you'll get to see some really disgusting pictures of people that don't practice good dental hygiene. You know, so anyway, if you are in a movable joint, the bones are very, very close together. You see that on the skull um, right here on our skull model. You can see, you know, you can see how close together they are. You can see the suture lines right here. Um, there we go. You can see our suture lines. You can see they're jammed up next to each other. That's what we want. We don't want to have any kind of movement going on. 
There is a layer of connective tissue though, holding those bones in place. So the connective tissue, you know, yes, the bones are jammed together. They have an irregular edge, they fit together, but there's still a layer of connective tissue. So there's no friction. The, in, our, in our teeth, we have this ligament called the periodontal ligament, which, which pr protects our tooth from the bone of the, of the mandible or the, or, the, or the maxilla. And it's that ligament that causes us so much grief when we're trying to have a tooth extracted. Okay, there's our suture lines. We have something called the syntomosis, more on that here in a second. And then the gomphosis is the uh, actual socket. See how deep into the jaw that the root of the tooth goes. You can see uh, all the way up into um, this area in here is the root. And so what you're seeing is you know, this, these teeth are much longer than just what's visible. Only the crown of the tooth is visible. The rest of the root is, is embedded in the bone of the maxilla. So it's, um, you know, it's a pretty large structure and it has to be protected from friction by the periodontal ligament. You know, and our bodies really do um, hate friction. It's just one of those things we just do not like. And um, so there, it also holds it very tightly in place. Now the slightly movable joints are the amphiarthrotic joints. They're held together by a hyaline cartilage or fibrocartilage. Now hyaline cartilage has been with us for a long time. When we are in utero, we start laying down our bony skeleton, our skeleton very early. After, after fertilization. We have a complete skeleton in place six weeks, <clears throat> six weeks after, for, after conception. And so at, at that point, we are about an inch long, but we have a full skeleton in place made of hyaline cartilage. And we'll talk about, you know, we'll talk about this lecture when we get into the bone chapter. So we have a skeleton, we're about six, we're about an inch long at six weeks, and it's all hyaline cartilage. Now, over the next 23 years, we gradually convert that hyaline cartilage skeleton into bone. There are a few remnants left in our bodies where we still have hyaline cartilage. The tip of our nose, the ears, uh, the connections between the ribs and the sternum, our airway, and the linings uh, of the ends of the long bones, fingers, toes, arms and legs, stuff like that. This is hyaline cartilage. Now the fibrocartilage, the other type of cartilage is what shows up at the uh, pubic symphysis uh, in, and the vertebral discs uh, in, uh, uh, in our vertebrae. We ha usually have a pad in here. And it isn't just, you know, that's not the only place where we're gonna have any kind of pad for cushioning. So this is a syndemosis. This is one of these slightly movable um, uh, joints. We have, uh, bless you, the connection, the, the tissue that holds us together is going to be a ligament, usually made of collagen fibers. Uh, and it's and here we see it, it's holding the fibula onto the uh, edge of the tibia. Now that these two bones are going to sit on top of the talus, our foot. The talus is the bone that um, sticks upright. Let me show you here. Here's our foot. Now this bone right here that is, sticks upright is called the talus. You can see it here in the side. This is the talus. And the uh, tibia is always on the medial side. The tibia lines up with the um, big toe. Your big toe is always on the medial side of your, of your leg. So the, the tibia is on this side and the fibula is on this side. And between the three of them, they make up the, act 
the ankle structure. The fibula is on the outside, the, the um, tibia is on the inside, and the talus is in the middle. This is what sticks up. And so what we see on the um, illustration there is the talus is not present, but the talus would be in this area right here. The talus would be in here. So our ankle, even though there is no ankle bone, the fibula on the lateral side, the outside of our ankle, the uh, medial malleolus from the tibia, there's the lateral malleolus, the talus is right in between here. Now, this is a slightly movable joint toward the, between the tibia and the fibula. And it is a very weak, uh, it's not a powerful structure. That is the weak side of our, um, of our foot. When we roll our ankle, we nearly always roll the ankle on the side of the fibula. And let's see if I can show this here. Yes. Let's try this one. Okay. Now here. So what we're looking at here is um, this structure right here. That is the right fibula, the one that's highlighted. This is the right tibia. And then this bone in the middle is the talus. And so this structure here is the lateral malleolus, right where I have my dark spot. And the medial malleolus is um, right there. And then the talus is in between. And so we have some ligaments and tendons that are holding this together. Let's see if I can add some of those in here for us. <coughs> Okay, now let's take a look here. We've got, uh, well, the Achilles tendon has shown up on here. There's the, this structure right there where I have the dot is the Achilles tendon. Let's see if I get some more stuff on here. No, I can't get the tendons to show, the ligaments to show. But what you can see is there is a coating of hyaline cartilage on the tibia to protect uh, the tibia and the fibula and the, the talus from all rubbing together. So that, that is, you know, we can't seem to get the uh, ligaments to show up. So, okay, let's go. On here, this is what happens now when you injure your ankle. This is a sprain or strain. What happens is we generally roll our ankle on the weak side. The weak side is usually the lateral surface, uh, the lateral malleolus of, of our ankle, the left side. And you can feel your, you know, you can feel your 
the, the malleolus on each side, rub the bump, the bump on each side of your ankle. The, what will happen is you'll have a, a ligament that attaches the calcaneus, the large bone in the back. This is the calcaneus muscle bone right here. That's the calcaneus. Uh, you can tell it's the calcaneus because this is the Achilles tendon right here. There's the calcaneus. When we roll our ankle on towards the lateral side, we can tear this ligament here and this ligament here. We can tear it, we can strain it, we can stretch it, um, and we can damage it. Now, how do we break our ankle? Well, since there is no ankle bone, you have a choice of three bones to break. You can break the talus, uh, you can break the tibia, you can break the uh, fibula. You know. uh, more than likely, it's going to be the fibula because that's the weak bone, but you can break anything that's in there. Yeah. Now, slightly movable joints also include things like the symphyses. Here we have fibro, fibrocartilage, the other type of cartilage, not the uh, hyaline cartilage like we find at the ribs, but we find this is the cartilage at the uh, pubic symphysis, for example. <clears throat> and so we're going to see uh, a pad of cartilage in between the pubic bones. And here we see it on our model right here. This is the pubic symphysis in the front. We all have a pubic symphysis. We all have a pad of cartilage there. The shock of motion comes up our legs and it spreads in the front to hit the pubic symphysis and is absorbed there. And the rest of it goes up our spinal column and is absorbed by these pads of cartilage here between the, the vertebrae. This is our pubic symphysis. Um, It's like trying to do it in a mirror. There we go. Let's try it just like this. There. There's our pubic symphysis right here on our female pelvis. And if you look in the back, you can see the vertebrae with the intervertebral disc. And here, same thing, same function, a shock absorber. Now on this image here that we see, the reason it is a dark band uh, is because it's soft tissue. X-ray doesn't show up on soft tissue. We know it's there because she would have, and this is a female patient. You can tell by the, the broad uh, pubic arch there at, at the bottom of the, of the, of the pelvis, um, just like this one has that broad arch in here. Um, she would not be able to walk if that if her pubic symphysis was met, was missing. So, so that's a very common example of a slightly movable joint with fibrocartilage involved uh, that is um, you know that we that everybody has. Everybody has intervertebral discs. Everybody has a pubic symphysis. Okay. There's our intervertebral disc. So now. The freely movable joints are the diarthrotic joints, the knee, the fingers and toes, the phalanges, the arms and the legs. Uh, these are all freely movable joints. There are more of these than anything else. The ends of the bones are covered with hyaline cartilage and are surrounded by a capsule that forms a cavity filled with fluid, filled with what we call synovial fluid. The synovial fluid has the density of uh, heavyweight motor oil or maybe pancake syrup. Uh, it's sort of gushy in there. And the bone ends never touch. They come close together, but they're never directly encountered here. And the, the synovial fluid, this goopy fluid in there, is designed to lubricate the bone ends and allow them to have the flexibility of motion without any friction, because we don't like friction. We don't like our bones to rub together because it hurts. If our bone ends rub together, they'll hurt. And if, and if they keep rubbing together, eventually they'll develop spurs and they'll start growing together. And of course, 
If it hurts to do something, what do we do? We don't do it. We don't do it. We don't do it if it hurts to do something. If it hurts to use your fingers to, to write with, you're going to stop writing. If it hurts to use your arm to do something, you're going to stop raising your arm. And the more you do that, the worse the problem that you have causing that pain gets. Because if, you're, if you are self-immobilizing the joint, then when you do try to move it, it's going to hurt even more. We don't want to, we, we don't want to tell our patients that. So, so the synovial fluid in a healthy joint is there to lubricate. So we have this free range of motion. We, we love uh, our, our synovial fluid because it doesn't hurt when we do things. It doesn't hurt to manipulate your environment with your fingers uh, or your, you know, to move things around or just to get up and walk. We, we love our fluid for things like that. These synovial joints are the most common type of joint in our bodies. So, so that's the type of joint by movement, the freely movable joint. Now structure, we have what's known as the fibrous joint, the cartilaginous joint, and the synovial joint. Now the fibrous joint, the bones are held together by tissue. Like I said earlier, the bones of the skull have, uh, uh, have connective tissue holding them together that weave back and forth so that they don't move. Even though they're, they're butted up against each other, we don't want to have any friction. So this is, the, this is one type of fibrous joint. It's connective tissue. We see that again. The uh, joint at the end of the tibia and the fibula is also a fibrous joint. It's, you know, it's one of those slightly movable joints, but it is uh, collagen fibers and connective tissue in here holding it all together. You know, the sutures in the skull are a fibrous joint, so are this, uh, so is this uh, connection at the tibia, it's called the tibiofibular joint. We have the same thing at our ulna and our radius at the end of the forearm. You can see, let me bring up, uh, let's take away some of this stuff here. The, uh, at the end of the, at the distal end of the ulna and the radius, you will see it right here. There's our radius. There's the round head of the radius right there and the ulna and the electronon process right next to it. But where the distal end is down here by the carpals, these are the these are the carpal bones along here in the wrist. And there is no socket. There's nothing here for them to butt up to. But we have uh, ligaments and tendons that are holding this together, particularly ligaments. Now, and, and so every time we use our wrist, every time we move our forearm, we are rubbing those ligaments against each other uh, and against the, the bones. Anybody know what kind of ligament gets affected right there in the forearm? What, uh, that causes a great deal of problems? Carpal tunnel, thank you, yes, indeed. Carpal tunnel, we inflame the, the connective tissue around our bones because we, we overdo it. If we have uh, some sort of we call it a repetitive motion injury where you're doing the same thing again and again and again, you know, where you're, you're whatever kind of work you're doing, uh, you're use your, using your arm the same way every time. And it, it ultimately can inflame the, uh, the connective tissue around the, the muscles and the bones there. And it hurts to the point that it's, it's so inflamed that you can't raise your arm 
higher than this. Extremely painful. Uh, I had a very, very minor taste of that. Um, about eight years ago, I was painting my house in the summer and I was painting the outside of it. I didn't have, you know, it was, it was a single story. So I only had to get to the, to the roof line. And I was using a roller on a brush that's going like this all day long. And so I went around the house for about two weeks. And at the end of the end of the two weeks, I couldn't raise my arm because I had kept using this arm all the time. And I had inflamed the uh, connective tissue in here uh, and I had a very, very mild case of, of carpal tunnel, and it went away after a couple of weeks and a lot of Advil and a lot of Advil. And, uh, but it was incredible. And that was just a mild case. Imagine if you are, have a patient that does the same job day in and day out, over and over and over again. Uh, whatever, maybe they're a roofer, maybe they are. Uh, a floor installer where they're always uh, doing the same type of work over and over again. I used to live in Virginia uh, in the valley where they had a whole lot of uh, poultry plants. And uh, in the area I lived in, they, had, they would process turkeys to the tune of like 30,000 a day. And you'd have lots of uh, people that worked there and they would have, it was a, it was a, uh, it was a uh, uh, an assembly line, if you will, or a disassembly line, because they would just, the bird would come down, they'd make a cut, and it would go on. The next bird would come down, make a cut again, and they keep doing this over and over and over again. If they didn't injure themselves on the sharp uh, knives and cutting tools, they would all end up with carpal tunnel because of this repetitive motion injury in here. So it's not unusual. And it's the ligaments and tendons that are right around the end of the ulna and the radius, right here. You know, this area right here is where you're gonna see it and then up and running up the arm too along this area. So um, lots of people call it uh, tennis elbow. You probably heard the term tennis elbow. Same thing, you know, again, it's, you know, for people that are uh, athletes that play tennis professionally or even at, at the you know collegiate or high school level, you know, it's the constant motion of the forearm that can that can cause that. So now we had the fibrous joints, the cartilaginous joints. Let me bring this up on the other screen. Eventually I'll learn to remember to do that. Um, the cartilaginous joints have a little motion. The fibrous joints may have a little motion, but they also may be pretty well immobilized too. It just depends. Now, if you are a cartilaginous joint, you have a little give, and you're either gonna be, there's three things you can be. You can either be uh, a fibrous joint, like uh, the pubic symphysis or the inner, uh, inner vertebral disc. Um, you can be the costosternal joint, you know, where the hyaline cartilage connects the, the ribs to the sternum, or you can be something called the epiphyseal plate. The epiphyseal plate is our growth plate. The growth plate is what we have in our long bones where we continue to grow after we've laid down our skeleton. You know, after six weeks from conception, we have the full skeleton place made out of hyaline cartilage we will gradually ossify that, turn it into bone. We're not done doing that until we're about 23 years old. Now, most of our bones have uh, ossified to some extent, but we continue to grow in our long bones at both ends, here and here. And we have these, what we call the epiphyseal plate. It's a growth plate. And up until about 23 years of age, our bones continue to lengthen a little bit from each end. You know, they don't, you know, they don't grow out, this end doesn't grow out, and this end doesn't grow out, but they're pushed out as the growth takes place in these areas here. Once the growth plate consists of hyaline cartilage that is that is enlarging and then gradually turning to bone, it becomes calcified and then we have new bone and we continue to do this 
And about the age of 23, we stopped doing that. And you can see on an x-ray what it looks like. Let's bring it up here. Okay. Um, the epiphyseal plate is what we call a synchondris, uh, a, um, it is a synchondrises where we have a, a little bit of movement, um, but not a whole lot, a little, but we have some flexibility here. This, okay, let me go on and I'll show it to you and then we'll come back to that one. This is what the epiphyseal plates look like. The epiphyseal plates, uh, in, when they're growing, they look like a dark line. The dark line is present because there's cartilage in there. We, there's hyaline cartilage in between the bone. This is the growth area right here. The hyaline cartilage is growing and um, it's being converted to bone and, and the bones are getting longer. We have a growth plate here at the top end of the tibia and there's one, it's bottom end. We, we can't see it, but there's one here at the top and bottom of the, of the fibula. And of course, there's one at the top and the bottom of the femur, or we could say the proximal and distal ends. And so we see the dark line there. That's the that's because soft tissue doesn't show up on x-ray. Now over here, once we're past 23 or thereabouts, <clears throat> all we see is a scar or a line. So there we say we have the epiphyseal plate. Here we have the epiphyseal line. The once we stop growing lengthwise. Then we, that uh, the epiphyseal plate shuts down. The bone, it, the last of the hyaline cartilage is calcified and we just get a little fuzzy white line across there. And you can tell the age of an individual by looking at their x-ray, you can at least say, you know, that they are under 20, or over 20. You, know, you have a, a patient that can't communicate or they're unconscious and they have an injury and you have an x-ray of one of the long bones. And if, the, if you see the white line, you know that they're, they're past usually about 23 years of age. If you see the dark, you know, the dark line, it means they're under 23 because lots of people <clears throat> are in that, uh, in that indeterminate appearance. You can't tell just by looking at somebody often how old they are so you but you can look at the look at their if you have an x-ray <clears throat> you can look at their bone and, and make that kind of assessment now let me go back just drop my leg glad i didn't break my femur so okay. now i've said this before but there is no such thing as being double jointed. People are extra flexible. Their joints are extra stretchy. The ligaments and tendons and the capsules around their joints let them do all sorts of bizarre things with their fingers and their hands and their arms. And yeah, it's like that. You know, you can uh, you can bend the tip of your finger down and keep the rest of it straight. You can uh, my my one of my one of our sons. Uh, can put his ankle behind his head and think nothing of it because of the flexibility. That's not unusual, but it's not double jointed. Nobody, I'm here to trace that. It would be extremely unusual for anyone to be double jointed. Well, the you know, before people understood it very well, they just they said, you look like you have extra joints. So the term stuck double jointed. It, it just did, you know. And, and then even now, <clears throat> you know, it's called, it's, it's easy to say, oh, you look like you're double jointed. Instead of saying, well, you're actually really got flexible joints. Some people, you know, when you, when you deal with patients, you can explain to them what it means. There's nothing wrong with, with them. They're not a mutant, you know. They don't have any superpowers, um, but you know you do have a certain amount of flexibility. Now that may help later in life when dealing with arthritis or, or something along those lines, because arthritis, of course, is an inflammation of the bone ends. Eighty-five percent of us, meaning most of us, are going to get arthritis at some point. Uh, arthritis is, is osteoarthritis is very common. 
it's simply wear and tear on the bone. It's, it's a wear and tear condition. Yeah, the more active we are, the healthier we are, but the more active we are, the more likely we are to encourage wear and tear on our bones. And so that's the price we pay. But most of us are gonna develop arthritis, just inflammation of the joints uh, on the bones. And you know, you, you, in, in that case, you can treat the symptoms, um, you can uh, treat the condition. There's all sorts of things that you can do um, for arthritis. Um, yeah. Any good anti-inflammatory will help a lot. Um, things like that. But anyway, the reason that we have adult, the condition of being double jointed is simply because our joints are, uh, our ligaments and our joints and our joint capsules are just extra flexible. And if you if you are double jointed, it's a pretty cool thing to do. You know, strange things with your fingers and your hands and your arms and stuff. You know, so. Um, That's a, that's a good question. My arm didn't feel the way it does until after I broke my mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it does. You know, the, the growth plate may be a, um, a weak spot uh, in your arm or your leg where you can, if you break it, 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 it may not heal exactly the same way. You know, uh, my nephew, when he was 12 years old, was trying to convince his friends that he could ride his bicycle standing on the seat with his arms out like this. And he did for about 50 feet and then it went over and he broke his humerus. The following summer, this is, this is another one of those hold my beer moments. The following summer, he was trying to tell some of his friends how he broke his arm. And he said, it was just like this. And he got on his bicycle, did it again, and fell and broke his arm at the same spot second time. So, and his arm has, has never been completely right ever since. Well, because it's a lot more than it used to. Okay. So, oh. yeah, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. So, because if you've injured, you yeah. So, uh, that's not normal. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's just. That's because of the you got a you got a little more twist in your bone thanks to the fracture at the epiphyseal plate, and that's perfectly fine. Yeah, I don't know what it's crazy. That's it. Probably you probably also have to stretch the tendons too, when you, you know, at, at the injury site. Yeah. That was the best. That's you, right. That was the best you could do. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. So. Yeah. So it, th these are. This is a good example. This is a good example of things that our bodies can do, particularly after an injury. You know, it, uh, we, uh, we heal, but we don't exactly, sometimes we don't heal back to the way we were before. And, and the thing is, you know, a common mis mis misconception is that after you've had an injury, after you've had a fracture, that it's never going to be as strong as it was before. It's just as strong, if not stronger, at the site of the injury. Because when, when, you know, because our, our bones are always remodeling and they're going to, you know, they're going to, the, the way, when we talk, we'll talk about fractures in the lecture, but the way we, we repair a fracture makes it even stronger than it was before. And our body remodels and remodels and remodels. And so our bones get stronger every time we remodel. So, yeah. Is there a way to train your body to be double jointed? Since it's a flexible You know, I, I, I don't know, but I mean, I guess if you stretch the ligaments enough, you could probably do that. You know, uh, at least in the areas that you can ha have some control over. You know, um, I would imagine a gymnast uh, is going to be more more flexible than someone who isn't. You know, because a gymnast, even if they weren't, as they say, double jointed. You know, if you watch a gymnast do a like the, the floor routines and the, the movement that they get in the floor routines is is amazing. You know, 
most people don't have that kind of flexibility and they have to work at it. They have to train at it to, to keep that level of flexibility. So, yeah, I would imagine you could probably gain some, some aspects of it by just working at it. You know, I don't know if you would get all the natural flexibility, but I bet you get a lot of it. So, okay. The cavity, a, a, a synovial joint is a specialized joint. It has two bones that come together and there's a cavity that forms around the joint. The bones are lined with hyaline cartilage so that the ends of the bones are protected so that there's no friction if they were ever to rub together. Now the hyaline cartilage won't last very long if they are rubbing, but it is there to protect the ends of the bones. The capsule goes all the way around the joint. And the area that's highlighted in green represents uh, part of the capsule. So it's like this, this, this sac around the air filled with synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is a lubricant. Uh, and so we don't have any friction. We have a lot of give in that particular joint. And we continue to make uh, synovial fluid our, our whole life. You know, we may run into a problem. Some, some of your patients may run into problems where they don't make as much synovial fluid as they did before. And so their joints are gonna stiffen up or they're gonna have pain. They're gonna have uh, bone spurs forming, things like that. Um, and that's, that happens. So now where do we see the synovial joints? Our shoulder, our hip, our elbow, three fourths or uh, two thirds, three fourths of our knee is a synovial joint. Uh, the bones of the wrist uh, and the Phalanges are all synovial joints because we have great flexibility. You know, we have we have a lot of flexibility in our wrist. We don't necessarily have that in our foot. The tarsal bones, which are the counterpart to the carpals, we have flexibility, but we don't have this range of motion. We can't do things like this with our feet, you know, because the uh, the carpal bones have that flexibility. Here's an example of what happens at our shoulder. Look at the range of motion you get with that synovial joint at the shoulder. You can take your arm and you can rotate it almost a full 360 degrees all the way around. We have to bend it a little bit to make the full circle. But you know, we can we have a great range of motion here. We don't get to do that usually with our with our hip. We don't. Uh, now, some people have that kind of flexibility in here, but most people don't. Uh, we, have, we have some, we, we all have a range of motion here, but most of us have this full range of motion at the shoulder because of this synovial joint. The shoulder is a very, very simple joint. It's just held together. Uh, it's, it's the humerus held against the glenoid cavity, uh, surrounded by ligaments and tendons and muscles and using the scapula and the clavicle to help the whole thing come together. And it works very well. We get to do all sorts of amazing things with our arm because of this wide range of motion here. Now, one other thing that we have to, to protect us in these, uh, in these synovial joints in particular, where we're going to have the risk of great friction, we have um, pads. We have specialized pads um, to, to protect the bones. We call these pads a meniscus. And this is a meniscus right here. These are these pads that we find in our knee, for example, but we also have them in our, at our mandible. And we also have them here at where the sternum and the clavicle come together. So this is, let's show you this. This is the, the meniscus. This is the medial meniscus here. This is the lateral meniscus over here. And what that does is it protects the the end of the femur, here's the end of the femur, the medial and lateral, the, 
the medial and lateral condyles of the femur are protected from the medial and lateral condyles of the tibia. So there's no friction. And so when we, when the, at the knee joint, when our femur is articulating with the um, tibia, these pads of cartilage are in between. Now they're called the meniscus or menisci. And, you know, if you, if you're an athlete or you, uh, know someone who's an athlete and they say that they have torn the cartilage in their knee, they're usually talking about one of those pads of cartilage, the meniscus we see in the illustration up there, you know, functioning as a shock absorber and we tear it. And that's what, you know, what, where that, uh, that's the, the cartilage that we're usually talking about. They help to stabilize the knee. There's a cushion then for the femur when it's butting up against the tibia. We also have them in our, at our mandible, where the mandible articulates with the underside of the jaw. We have them at our sternum, uh, and you can actually see it right here, where the sternum and the uh, clavicle come together. Let me bring it up on the screen. Okay. We have a pad of cartilage, a meniscus, right in here and one right in there so that uh, we, it doesn't hurt as the clavicle butts up against the sternum. Remember, this is the clavicular notch right in that region there, there, and there. And here's one of our clavicles, and here's the other clavicle there. And they're going to articulate against those, against those pads right in this area here. So it doesn't hurt. We don't want it to hurt. If it hurts, we won't move. We don't like pain. Uh, and so we have, you know, it helps to stabilize that joint, and it reduces any friction that might occur there too. Now, the other type of structure that helps us out is called a bursa sac. And a bursa sac is a bag of synovial fluid. It's like a, like a heavy duty, if you can imagine a, a heavy duty water balloon, you know, real thick uh, water balloon filled with hot cake syrup, you know, something, or corn syrup, something goopy, something thick. And these bags of the, these bursa sacs uh, meet that description. And we find them whenever we're going to have bones and muscles and tendons and ligaments rubbing together. And so we would have a bursa sac uh, in our shoulders to, because we have lots of ligaments and tendons and muscles there and bones that would rub together. We find them in our knee. Uh, Anywhere where we're gonna have motion and a chance of friction, we're gonna have a bursa sac. And we, it looks something like this. Here's our knee. Um, and you can see there's the femur. This is a side view of the femur and the tibia, the sagittal cut, if you will. And there's the femur, there's the patella. There is the bursa sac right here. This is the patellar tendon doesn't show up well because it's really soft tissue. But this is the bursa in here with synovial fluid. Now, if we have inflammation, it looks like this. So you have your, your femur, your tibia, your patella, your patella tendon, and this one area is the inflammation of the bursa sac because of constant irritation. Someone who has uh, <coughs> played con a, a lot of contact sports and has damaged the knee from constant uh, pressure and irritation, uh, constant motion. Someone who spends a lot of time at work uh, where they would be on their hands and knees, like, like a, uh, someone putting down a floor, someone working to, in, you know, an electrician installing wiring, uh, 
you know, anything that would involve that kind of practice where you would be uh, putting pressure on the knee, you know, uh, and you get this inflammation going on here and it's very painful. Uh, and like, you know, inflammation is our body's response to the irritation. It's, you know, it's gonna, the knee's gonna swell. Uh, there's gonna be extra fluid there. Inflammation brings in more white cells and more red cells for oxygen, lots of lupus where we have pain because it's bringing in more fluid. That's why it hurts. It used to be a very, bursitis in the knee used to be a very, very common occupational injury uh, with uh, cleaners. When you're back about um, 50 or 60 years ago, uh, most industrial cleaners were, uh, most of the crews that did cleaning were women and they would clean floors by hand with a scrub brush. And they would scrub the floors at night, buildings would be closed and they'd be in there cleaning each floor and they'd be scrubbing these, these long, these hallways with a scrub brush and a buffing pad and they'd do it by hand. And if they did that for 30 or 40 years, they would have this significant inflammation in their knee and they used to call it housemate's knee. That was the old term for it because if they cleaned that way at work, they would clean that way at home. And you would, the inflammation would, would you know, it was, this was before they used the steroids to fight that inflammation. And you know, it, would, it would involve rest and lots of aspirin because that was about the only over-the-counter anti-inflammatory in those days uh, and stop working essentially. So, but anytime you have an irritation like that of the bursa sac. Now a very common irritation is what we mentioned earlier, carpal tunnel. This is what the bursa sac that surrounds the ligaments in the forearm would look like. It becomes inflamed and it's very painful. You can't move your arm, it hurts to move your arm very much. Okay, now we have our knee. It is the uh, most complex uh, synovial joint in the body. And it's not even a complete synovial joint because uh, the, uh, the sac, the, the uh, capsule only covers three sides of it. The fourth side is, uh, uh, is exposed in the front. But it is a uh, it is a synovial joint because it does have uh, the the the, uh, the capsule and the um, it's it actually is three different joints together. It has the connection between the patella, the kneecap, uh, and the uh, femur. That's one joint, and then it has two joints where we have the connection between the femur and the tibia. So it's three separate joints all together here. Um, it allows us to bend our legs at the knee. We can bend our legs back. We can extend our legs at the knee. We have a very limited range of motion from side to side. And we certainly don't like to have our, we, we have, we, we don't have any safe range of motion backwards. Our knees don't like to go backwards. That's, that's bad. So, so this is typical knee movement. You can see um, the, the bending of the knee. The purpose of the kneecap, it does a couple of things for us. First of all, the, the kneecap sets in the patellar tendon uh, uh, right here. Here is our model of the knee. You all got one back there. Uh, and you can, if you want to pass that around, that'd be great. Uh, this is the patellar tendon right here in the front and the kneecap is in there. And partly, part of what the, the uh, patella does is keep the patellar tendon elevated off the bone. So that there's no friction in here. Because you'll notice when it comes around, you'll see that the patella sets right in that notch between the condyles and the tendon doesn't touch. It doesn't touch the bone. So if you look right here, you can see there's the patella and right in here 
in this space, the, the patella keeps the patellar tendon off of the bone. So there's no friction from that occurring. The other thing the patella does is that's the, plate, that's the point of insertion of the, uh, quad, the quads, the quadricep muscles in the front. They all insert there and they also are kept off of uh, the femur. So there is a real, you know, we, we tend to think, well, what do, what do we use the patella for? You know, well, it actually has a pretty big role here in the flexibility of, uh, of our knee. So it isn't just the patella that makes up the knee structure. So now, so there's our, there's our knee. We're looking at it, we've slid the uh, patella over with the patella tendon off to the side. And what you're seeing here, is the anterior cruciate ligament, a very common injury. We see the patella inside the patellar tendon or ligament. And we also see, of course, this is the femur up here and the tibia down here. And you can see the meniscus pads here and here too. Now the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments, what do they do for us? Well, they keep the knee from, they help to stabilize the joint and they keep the knee from sliding around, particularly backwards. Now the ACL that you hear a lot about as a sports injury, the ACL uh, extends, let me bring that slide back. The ACL right here, we're looking at this, we're looking at the front side of the knee here. There's the front, what, what you're seeing is the front of the ACL. It attaches, the front of the ACL attaches to the top of the tibia and it extends backwards and attaches to the lateral condyle of the femur. Of the, of the femur. So here is our tibia right here. And this, this is the area between the condyles. This is the, this is the lateral condyle of the tibia and the medial condyle, lateral condyle of the femur and the medial condyle here. And so we attach <coughs> towards the front of the tibia here and extend backwards and attach to the lateral condyle of the femur. The posterior cruciate ligament connects to the um, back side, the posterior surface of the tibia, posterior surface of the tibia. Here's the uh, posterior cruciate ligament. It attaches to the back side of the tibia and the medial condyle of the femur. Why do we call them cruciate? Because they cross. That's what cruciate means, it means cross. Uh, like you've ever heard the term crucifix? Well, that's the root word. Uh, appreciate the root word for all that. Um, so they cross. And what they do is they're attached to the front of the tibia and the back of the femur and the back of the, the uh, tibia and the front of the femur. So they cross over and they help to stabilize that joint. But as such, they get a lot of stress. And the ACL is easily, I should say easily, but the ACL is more frequently injured in particularly in contact sports than the PCL. They both can be damaged, but typically an ACL tear tends to happen more often than a uh, posterior tear. And it looks something like this. Let's bring it up here. Okay, this is an ACL injury. There's your anterior cruciate ligament. We are looking at the, on the left-hand side, we're looking at the front of the, uh, the knee, and you can see the ACL there attached to the uh, tibia. And if we, um, now on the, one, the image on the right, we're looking at it from the back side, the posterior surface, and you can see the ACL is attached to the lateral condyle. I know it's, we know it's the lateral condyle because there's the fibula, uh, down below and the fibula is on the lateral side. So we're, we're damaging our ACL. We're tearing it there. Something overstretched the, uh, uh, the ligament and it tore. 
Yeah. Well, I think that's a good question. I think we tear the ACL. I didn't mean to sound that. What? No. Um, but I, I think we tear the ACL because the ACL is protecting us from our knee uh, sliding backwards, and I, I think we get we get stressed more easily from clipping contact sports. We get hit in the knee, or we go to turn our leg, and turning it. You know, if, if, if for example, you put your foot down. And you go to, to, to turn your leg and and move, and your body turns, and your foot still stuck in the ground, and it doesn't turn, and then you put sudden stress on that on that ACL because the ACL is trying to keep your leg from going backwards, and all of a sudden you're making it go backwards, or somebody is helping you make your leg go backwards. You know, that's why they call them contact sports. So, or we fall down, or we do some dumb things, or you know. We injure ourselves in bizarre ways, you know. Uh, we do all sorts of things to ourselves, things that don't make any sense later. You know, um, you know it. Um, you know it. Things like you ever ever anybody ever break a finger in in a door? You know how it, when you're going out of the house and you pull the door shut and you pull your hand back real fast, right? You know what I'm talking about? You're like, okay, I'm just gonna. Pull the door shut and go out. Well, guess what? If you're not fast enough when you give it a good yank, sometimes your fingers are still in the door when the door goes shut. Yeah. I know for a fact. So now how did I explain that to my doctor? I said, well, I was trying to shut the door and I broke my finger while it was still in the door. And I had to actually get up and demonstrate in his office how I did it because he couldn't believe how I, how I did it. You know the latches on car door, like in the car doors, latches. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. My sister had her finger fell up in that latch. My brother didn't see it. He shut the door and broke her uh -huh. finger. Her finger was like this, and the bone popped out. Ah, uh, okay. Well, you, what I did in this finger is I cracked the bone this way, you know, uh, vertically. So all he did was tape it up. Oh, she had to get stitches. Oh, like they had yeah. to pop back and everything. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Um, things like you know, that is the most ridiculous injury I think I've ever had. <laughs> is you know, slamming my finger. How did I get my fingers? How did I break my finger? Well, I slammed the door on it all. You know, how, yeah, and of course, that opens up all sorts of other discussions. But we do dumb things. You know, not really dumb, we're just that's how they call them accidents. You know. I don't know how that happened. I was like, car was a little so I don't know why they take it up. Oh yeah, yeah. I, oh, I understand that. Yeah. Somehow, close three of your phone. You know. My brother got his head spun on him on the window, and I got I have accidentally had the car door slammed with my fingers too. So uh, that's a little more forgiving than a, than a house door for whatever <laughs> reason. So because there's more insulation on the car door, so it. Uh, in fact, I was in college and it happened to be on a field trip. And I, for some reason, I had my hand around the, the door pillar, and the person in the front seat shut the door. And I said, "Excuse me, could you open the door? My hand, my fingers are still in there." Because it didn't hurt; it was just, it was just awkward. And then it, it was a bruise, but it wasn't like, like slamming it with a hard. Like if, if I, if you slam in that door, that door is solid wood, and it's heavy, and I would, you know, definitely not want to put up with that. So. There are accidents. We do things. We don't expect to break our finger or we don't expect to tear our ACL, but we do. And the ACL, because of its role in keeping our knee from going backwards, seems to catch the brunt of the injury. Because you hear, we always hear a lot about ACL injuries in sports. You know, um, you watch any football this weekend, I guarantee you, you're going to hear somebody having an ACL injury somewhere. Uh, don't hear a lot about uh, PCLs. But they can tear too. It just um, it just takes you know. In that case, you're trying to keep the knee from going forward too much, I guess, you know, from uh, from behind or something. Anyway, okay. There's our ACL and PCL. There's the femur. There is the PCL. The PCL always connects to the medial condyle of the femur. 
and to the posterior surface of the tibia, the ACL, which is right underneath it here, always attaches to the lateral condyle of the femur and the posterior and the anterior surface of the uh, tibia. And we, you know, that's why it's called the posterior cruciate and the anterior cruciate, and they cross over there in the middle. There's the fibular ligament. That's the, the fibula actually does something. It attaches the um, uh, fibula, it, atta it helps to hold the uh, tibia and it helps to hold that joint together because it holds the femur to the, uh, the gap, it holds the femur up against the tibia and, and the, the, that ligament is actually attached to the fibula pulling down on the femur. Its counterparts on the other side where the tibia it has a ligament attached to the uh, femur, that one over here. Now there's the lateral meniscus. Remember that the fibula is always in the lateral side. So that tells you which is lateral, which is medial. Fibula, tibia, medial meniscus, tibial uh, ligament. Here we can see it from the other side. There's our patellar ligament again, tibia the fibula, the fibular ligament, and the femur. Now, our knees are prone to injury. There we have a dislocated knee. You know, it has, it, it has popped out of position. This usually requires a little more work than just your shoulder. Your shoulder has an awful lot of ligaments and tendons and muscles holding it in place. You dislocate your shoulder and it's, it's um, you can work with it, but your knee, if, if your knee dislocates, you know, you've got, you've got four ligaments that may be damaged. You know, you've got the, the medial ligament and you have the lateral ligament, you have the patellar ligament, you actually have five. And then you have the ACL and the PCL. So if this thing is um, dislocated, you may have all sorts of damage going on there too. So yes, you can get it popped back in place, but sometimes we don't like it. Okay, now, when we have knee damage, a lot of wear and tear, we see a knee replacement. This is what, how the knee replacement surgery works. The condyles of both the tibia and the femur are, are worn, so we remove them. We cut away the remove the damaged tissue and we replace them with new condyles that are usually made of titanium. Uh, and we use it, we put in an artificial meniscus. And here what we're doing there is um, you're going to see the uh, the new uh, condyles for the tibia, a uh, new condyles for the uh, femur, and a new meniscus in between, and then you're gonna trim off the extra material on the, on the patella, and it's going to be better than it was before. This is an artificial, this is the top part of a, of a knee replacement structure. These are the condyles of the tibia. They go on the end of the tibia, and their counterpart is the uh, condyles for the, the tibia, and they go, they go on the end of the femur, and there's the condyles that they're going to put in there in a second. Usually made of titanium with some sort of uh, elastic pad in between. And if you know anybody that's ever had a knee replacement surgery, you know, they go from re being barely able to walk to being extremely flexible and, and have a great range of motion again. Uh, and it works. It works very well. The you can always tell because they have a very long scar that runs from somewhere mid thigh down in into uh, above the above the, the uh, tibia. Now, this is what the whole thing looks like put together. On the right hand, on the left hand side of the picture, you see the uh, what you've got is the femoral component uh, going around, and that's the the condyles. And then the tibial component is on top of the tibia. The ligaments, the lateral and medial ligaments are still there. The patellar ligament is still there because you still have to, ha the, the knee has to stay there 
because the uh, quadricep muscles are still attached to it. And the ligament, the patellar ligament still attaches to the uh, tibia. So there is, a, there is still a role for the patella in here, even after the surgery. And we have this great flexibility. Okay, now, hip replacements, a little different. A little more complicated, but not that much. Actually, the recovery time on a uh, knee surgery is probably a little longer than on, on the hip. Uh, I know, you know individuals that have had knee replacements who have taken you know, three or four weeks to recover, and I've known people with hip replacements that are, are you know, completely mobile within two weeks. So it all depends. Now, in the hip, uh, a lot of things drive the hip replacement. It can be uh, a fracture uh, of the hip. It can be just wear and tear on the hip too. Uh, we can see inflammation going on here uh, in this in this picture. Uh, the um, usually one of the causes of uh, hip replacement is a weakness uh, in the bone. The uh, if we take a look here. Uh, one of the most common injuries in older people, particularly older females, postmenopausal females, is a fracture of the of the femur right here at the neck, right in that area. There's the femur. There's the, there's the neck of the femur right where that spot is. Now the neck of the femur becomes a weak spot. See our bone. We have two types of bone. We have compact bone, which is very hard and very thick. And we, that lines the outside of all of our bones. And depending on what kind of stresses we have, uh, like for range of motion, we're either gonna have what's known as spongy bone or we're gonna have more compact bone. The shaft of the femur has uh, compact bone, hard, dense bone. But the ends of the femur are going to have spongy bone because the femur has to go through a lot of stresses as we move. And so spongy bone can take those stresses and spread them out. You know, it looks like the inside of a sponge. And so all the, 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 the structure of the bone just spreads the stress out and the shock of motion is then spread out through the, the uh, head and the neck, of, neck and the head of the femur, and then into the acetabulum right here, and then into, into the spinal, cord, spinal column here. Well, osteoporosis likes to dissolve uh, spongy bone, and it goes after the ends of the femur. And so it, um, when osteoporosis occurs, and it only occurs in about 30% of postmenopausal females, but when they break their hip, what they're really doing is breaking the neck of the femur right there. And so it's a very easy process. Instead of trying to put a, you know, cast it and rebuild the, the joint, rebuild the bone, it's just very easy to cut the, the femur, the tip, the top of the femur off somewhere in this area and put in an artificial hip. Uh, like you see here, here is an artificial hip. Uh, typically, you cut off enough the femur and then run this part down into the shaft. Uh, and this is supposed to sound like bone rasp, and you use this to rough up the, the shaft. And then you jam that in and use super glue, literally, and wire it. So. And the, it's uh, the shaft is usually titanium. The ball is stainless steel. But before it goes into use, it usually has some sort of uh, nonstick surface put over it. Yeah. Um, okay, it's nice, um, but this is like heavy. Like, can people feel? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and they'll trigger alarms, metal detectors too. You know, but it, you know, even though it's titanium, it's lighter than steel. It's also stronger than steel. Um, but yeah, they can they can feel it in their knees. I'm just okay. I I've had the surgery. I had like the back surgery. It was thoracic, and so I have like rods and stuff, but I can't feel any difference. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, like, since you know, 
I think you might be able to feel that because I mean you can feel the you know you can feel your bones you know you you have you know pretty good uh, ability to to reach the, to, to uh, touch the condyles in your in your leg in your in your tibia and on your femur so you would probably be able to feel that because because that's really close to the surface too you know uh, I mean I've got a I've got a, a three inch long pin in my thumb, which I know it's there. I don't feel it unless I press right in here. I, I can feel the end of it, but I don't feel it in my in my thumb. So uh, it uh, some days it hurts, but I don't feel the pin itself. You know? So do you you don't feel the pins from your surgery or no? I don't think that's what this is like, but that's like yeah yeah I, same thing you know yeah. I'm, I'm expecting it to hurt this weekend with all the rain we're supposed to get. So, but yeah, that's, and that's perfectly normal, you know. Uh, you know, that's a very good question. I, I, I have a friend at church who has both knees done. I'm gonna have to ask him if he can feel the, the metal parts in there. So, yeah, I, I don't think you would feel the hip uh, because that's a bed pretty deep in there. But uh, most people that have a hip replacement are so, so thrilled to have a replacement because they get their range of motion back. You know, it, you probably give them, have given them another 20 years of life, you know, with, with, with the, a quality of life. Yeah. Uh, knees and hips, you get all these old people that are mobile again. You know, it's it, sometimes it's scary, but you know, we won't go into that. So, could someone, I don't know, like, could someone just like get a hip replacement without it actually? Well, yeah, if, if they needed it, if the hip, if the hip joint was inflamed, they could have surgery. Uh, I don't think any reputable physician, any surgeon would agree to simply give someone a, an artificial hip just because they wanted one, you know, without any, any good reason for it. Now, having said that, there's probably healthcare professionals that would do that for any sum of money, you know, but you know, your your reputable physicians would never touch that. So why is this like actually? Well, because it, it's when you go into the bone, you have to grind away the edges of it, make it rough, so the uh, uh, the shaft of the hip has something to, to stick to. So because the the major the cavity in the middle of the bone is really smooth and slippery, so you want to have something uh, sort of irregular. And then they really do use super glue, uh, super glue and wire to hold it together. So, okay. And whenever we replace the hip, we got to replace uh, the acetabulum too, because it would do no good to have a brand new hip joint and a brand new uh, head made out of titanium or stainless steel if you had an acetabulum that was there and you just start wearing it away. So there's an artificial uh, component that goes into the acetabulum too. And it, it's a you know, pretty straightforward procedure. Usually what happens is they get their, have their surgery done. They're usually up with a walker in their first week. Second week, they're usually using a cane. And by the third week, they're walking unassisted. You know, and I've seen a lot of uh, older people at church like that. So, and, you know, now the x-ray does give you a good indication here of the health of the uh, bone. Now, a healthy, and that's got the, the artificial uh, hip in there on that side. You can see where the top of the uh, femur was cut off. Now, sometimes the cut can be way down here in the shaft, too. Depends on how much uh, uh, bone has been dissolved with osteoporosis. Bones generally need to be wider than this because a healthy bone has a lot of calcium. Calcium would look you know, like see how the white edges here show up. You would, the more calcium you have in a healthy bone, the, the whiter it's going to appear on X-ray, because the calcium is, is reflecting the, the uh, X-rays back. Calcium is what makes our bones hard. We like to have lots of calcium present. This person doesn't have a lot of calcium left except on the edges of their bone, and so this side over here is looking very much like it's going to be a candidate for replacement pretty soon too. This, this should be, uh, I'll show you in, in, in lecture, uh, this should be 
much denser in here. You should see a lot more uh, calcium present. So because it, it has been dissolved away, but that's what osteoporosis does. It dissolves away the calcium because our bodies need calcium in other places. And if, you're, if we're not getting it in our diet, then we're going to dissolve the bone. And if we dissolve bone faster than we lay it down, then that's what, that's sort of the definition of osteoporosis. Yeah. So I have a, I have a, a really white mark oh, that could be, uh, that may be pins in the hip to, uh, that have been put in to reinforce the, the pelvis. You know, because uh, you, know, you have the, the, the iliac bones here, uh, they don't look any better than the rest of the bones do. They all look pretty weak, but they would reinforce. And then the bone that's present, uh, the living bone that's present, would tend to grow around those bones to reinforce the structure. So, um, one of the things we'll see in lecture is that, and, and you've experienced this, uh, is that uh, North Beach surgeon will use lots of screws and bolts and pins in our bodies and the bone will go around that and lots of us have the structures in there and they, it, it's, it's it's nothing to see them drilling into a bone or using a saw on it to, to um, move bone around too if you have a fracture in an arm or a leg it you know it's and they and you've lost some bone because of the fracture. Uh, it's it's not, not unusual to shave off part of the, the iliac crest where healthy bone is and place that into the injury and, and it'll grow in there. And and once it's growing, it'll start shaping itself to the rest of the bone. So it happens. Yes. Why would you need the pelvis to be supported, especially in our older people? Well, because um, it may not be able to support the, uh, you know, you put in the, the hip bone. This is probably being done to reinforce the strength of that hip, reinforce that hip, that new hip joint so they can be mobile. Otherwise, you know, because as soon as they try to walk with this new hip, if they don't have, have it reinforced the pelvis, then they would fracture the pelvis. And now it's a whole other situation. I think this, in fact, she may have done that. I know it's a female because of the shape of the pubic arch there. And she may have already done that. And that's what, what's going on here. You know, I think rebuilding the pelvis, you know, and a lot of it depends on the age of the patient and you know how active they normally are. You know, are they, you know, it is um, uh, are you returning them to it, it's it's all about quality of life, right? Returning them to a good quality, a better quality of life. Do they have 10 more years or 20 more years of good activity, then it's a good thing. So if it just becomes something where they've done it and she'll be in a wheelchair for a couple of years and then, then pass away, is that such a good thing? Okay, you have to you know, consider all those, those angles too. Or are you going to help your patient? So, questions, thoughts? Want to get out of here? So, Okay, that's all I've got. Uh, we're done with uh, uh, all of our bones. So we will not have the bone test until probably the week of fall break. Fall break is 10 to the 11th. We'll have, we'll have lab that week, and so will the Wednesday lab. But we will uh, have our lab test. So have, we will start next week with muscles, So. I do. Next week, I've got a surgery on Thursday. Okay. So, talking to Yeah, we're going to start talking uh, muscles. So, come on in. Mm -hmm.